A couple of quick announcements before we get started. First of all, on the back table, right back there, you'll see the bulletins. On the back of the bulletins, got a place for you to fill in the blank sermon notes. It's really going to help you out not only today, but throughout the week as you think back to the sermon. There's also a basket back there that has our communion cups in those. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper at the end of the service today. So grab one of those, hold on to that. And we will observe communion together. Those of you who are joining us online, we're excited that you're with us this morning. You'll see uh, in the comments section a link to the digital connect card. Uh, click on that, fill that out, submit that. That comes directly to me. It's a great way to communicate with me. If you have questions, uh, need prayer about anything, best way probably to communicate with me. Those of you who are here in person, that's why we have this for you. So look, in the back of the seat in front of you, welcome card little space at the bottom where you can fill that out. Uh, drop that in the box in the back as well, uh, along with your offering. If you are uh, not giving digitally, which we have that option available, but if you're uh, giving physically, that goes in that white box on the back wall as well. Let's uh, begin our worship of the Lord this morning by reading a passage of Scripture talking about the power of God. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. And so we're going to pray uh, read scripture and then we're going to pray praising God for his power. First Chronicles 29 11 says yours Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours Lord is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Let's pray. God, we praise you this morning for your power. You are the God of all power. There's not a single thing in the universe that's not under your control that you don't have power over. And so we praise you this morning as our sovereign Lord who is the all-powerful God, who can speak worlds into existence. As we worship you this morning, the, the God of all power. Lord, I pray that we would bless your name. That we would make much of you this morning. And as we do, Father, I pray that you would bless us. That you would speak to us. That we would hear from heaven this morning as we worship. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me and let's worship the Lord in song. How deep the Father's love for us. Thank you. 
We know that Jesus said that, that adultery, like David committed, is not just a physical act, but it's, it's lust in the heart. And God, we're guilty of that. And so I pray that we would confess that this morning as a faith family, as we are moving ahead in our worship of you today, God. And, and like David, we know that, that when we confess our sins, God, you, you wash away the guilt of our sins. You, you wash away our sins. You separate us as far as the east is from the west. And our sins are no more. And we thank you for that this morning, God. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. And amen. Let's continue to worship that song. How great is our God.
God. The God who's worthy of all praise. The only God who is worthy of, of any praise. We worship you this morning. Guys, we, we've sung songs about Jesus coming and living and dying and being raised from the dead and the forgiveness of our sin and our eternal life with you because you are a great God, a mighty and powerful God. And so we worship you this morning. Or as we move into the time of the teaching and the hearing of your word, we want to pause and pray for our sister churches this morning, specifically today and, and all week this week, First Presbyterian Church. God, that is, they gather together as the pastor stands and proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ that lives will be changed for all eternity. God, we pray that for them and for us and for every church in our area, God, that, that you would do great things in and through us today. God, we lift up those who are not able to be here today. I know that, that uh, one is, is traveling because of a funeral. One is uh, getting over sickness. There are others who are physically unable to be here, others who are traveling, God. Lord, I pray that, that they would either tune in and, and watch our service today, God, or, or that wherever they are, that they would uh, seek out an opportunity to gather with the saints and worship you this morning. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would open our eyes and our ears to what you have to say, God, and that we would leave here a uh, changed people because of what you have said to us through your word today. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to finish up chapter 1 today. We're going to be in verses 15 through 23. If you don't have your Bible with you, grab one of those black hardback Bibles under the seat in front of you, and we are on page uh, 1036 in that Bible. Ephesians chapter 1 be on page 1036. Let me ask you this as you're turning. What, what is the, the best type of sermon? Is it a theological sermon or is it a very practical sermon? Now, now I know some of y'all are thinking, well, I didn't hear my answer. My answer was a really short sermon. That's not one of the options, and you know that's not going to be an option if you've been here any amount of time, but, but what's better, a theological sermon or, or a practical sermon? And here's what I mean. I'll hear this from time to time. I don't want a deep theological sermon. I, I want to. I want to go to church and I want to hear something that makes me that makes me feel good and gives me something that I can do throughout the week. And so that that's the kind of sermon. I don't. I don't need theology. I don't need all of that that doctrinal teaching. I just. I just want something that makes me feel good and, and gives me something to do this week. And the the problem with that is if you think. That that's the, the type of teaching that we're supposed to get from the Bible. You don't really understand theology. It, any biblical theology is going to lead to you doing something throughout the week. And, and here's, let me give you an example of that. Biblical theology teaches us that we are separated from God. As, as that passage I read from Psalm 51 just a minute ago, David said that, that he was a sinner from the time he was born, right? From the time he was conceived. We're, we're separated from God from the very beginning. And because we're separated from God, God rightly and justly can send us to hell. That's theology. And it goes further though. God can rightly and justly send us to hell, but God made a way where that didn't have to happen. God sent his son Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, listen, to be slaughtered, we, we often say, to die on the cross. But in Revelation, it says that he is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Slaughtered is what that means. When you think about the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were, they were slaughtering the animals to shed the blood, to cover the sin. So Jesus, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, slaughtered, died on the cross, was buried rose on the third day, is now seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. And listen, he is the only way to salvation. That, that's biblical theology. The, the only way that anybody goes to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And listen, 
If that doesn't move you to action, then something's wrong. If that doesn't move, to, to know that, that every single person that you know, your friends, your family, your coworkers, everybody that you know is either headed to heaven or hell based on what they've done with Jesus Christ. If that doesn't lead you to action, th then there's a problem. And so we're, we're continuing in Ephesians chapter 1. Remember we said that the first three chapters of Ephesians are, are theological. It's, it's doctrine. It's teachings about God. Teachings about uh, what we are to learn about God and what can be revealed about God. The, the last two weeks we pointed out that this letter was written to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, to the, to the faithful saints. And we're going to see that again this morning. We're going to talk about that a little bit more because we're going to talk about praying for the saints. Very important wording. I didn't say pray to the saints. I said pray for the saints. You, you remember we said that the Catholic Church would teach that, that there are certain people that have this elevated status. And, and we would pray to those people as saints. And they would argue that they're in heaven listening for our prayers and helping us out. And, and the only problem with that is that it's nowhere in the Bible. And that's what we call heresy. But we pray to God alone. Not to a saint, not to, to Mary, not to anybody else. Just to God alone. So, so who are the saints that, that are being talked about in, in this scripture and, and here today? The saints in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a, a saint. And so when we talk about praying for the saints, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about all those in Christ Jesus. And Paul tells the, the church at Ephesus, he says that, that I'm praying for you. He's, he's praying for the saints. And then he tells them what he's praying. So not only does he say, I am praying for you, he's saying, here's, here's what I'm praying for you. And this is one of the biggest differences between the early church and, and the modern church. I didn't do this because I didn't want to embarrass anybody. But, but if I went around this morning before service started, maybe before our Bible study time, and I said, hey, what can I pray for you about today? And I just wrote down a list. Here are some things that I probably would have heard. You know, work has got me really frustrated. If you could just pray for me about my job, that would be great. It, it's summertime, and the kids are at home now, and they're driving me nuts. Could you just pray about that? Uh, my husband, whoo, don't even get me started, right? My, my mom, my mom's sick. I stubbed my toe, right? My, my neighbor's cat is sick. Would you pray for her to get better? And listen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with praying for any of those except maybe for your neighbor's cat to get better. But, but the rest of them, there's nothing wrong with praying for any of those because those are all things that, that we're concerned about and that God is concerned about. But that shouldn't be the limit of our prayers. That's not what we're going to see in Ephesians 1 when Paul is praying. He's not going to be praying that they get over the stubbed toe, or that their blood pressure that's a little high will come down, or that their boss will get off their back. That's not what he prays. And so we need to pray the way that Paul would pray. But we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ the way that, that Paul prays for them. We need to, it's okay to pray about the, the earthly, the temporary things, but that shouldn't be the focus of our prayer. Now, that shouldn't be all that our prayer is about. Yeah, I would argue that it shouldn't even be the majority of what our prayer is about. Here, let, let me ask you some questions. When's the last time someone said, hey, how can I pray for you? And you said, listen, you know what? I, I'm struggling to memorize scripture. I'm trying. I've got it printed out. I'm reading it day after day after day, and, and it's just not sinking in. Would you pray for me that God would give me the ability to, to remember the scripture that I'm trying to memorize? Or, or how about this one? But would you pray for me that, you know, listen, I, I'm trying to get into the word every morning and I'm just having a difficult time getting up and getting going. Would, would you pray that, that God would help me to, to fall asleep faster, to get up earlier so that I can spend time with him every morning like I, like I want to? 
But would you, would you pray for me that I would just know Jesus more? Right? Well, when's the last time you, you asked somebody to pray for you in that way? And, and should we ask for someone to be prayed in that way, to pray for us in that way? And those are the kinds of prayers that we are going to see Paul praying. And listen, I think that we can learn something from him that may change the trajectory of our faith family, that, that may completely change the way that, that we operate as a faith family, individually and together. I think that we can see a big change. Listen to how David talked about God. Psalm chapter 63, I posted this on the, the church Facebook page earlier this week. Write down Psalm 63 so that you can go back and read the whole chapter. Here's just a little bit of what David says about God. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. My lips glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. I rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. When's the last time that you prayed for someone to know God and to love God like that? Or when's the last time you asked someone to pray for you to, to know God and to love God like David did? <clears throat> Paul is, is praying for the saints, and, and so should we. And we should pray for them in the same way that he prayed for them. So as we look at Ephesians 1, 15 through 23 this morning, following Paul's example, I'm going to give you uh, several ways that we should pray for the saints. Now, exercise real quick. You ready? I want you to look around. Elbow anybody that's asleep. Look around real quick. Seriously, quit looking at me and look around at the other people in the room. Those who are in Christ are the saints. Those people that you're looking at, that's who you should be praying for. So when we talk about this, this isn't just something off in outer space when we say praying for the saints. This is who we're talking about. I see you every Sunday. Y'all only see me. Sorry about that. Take the time and look around and see who is around you, who you should be praying for. Uh, let's, let's rethink how we should pray for our faith family. Let's, let's rethink how we should pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. As we move through, let's rethink about praying for the saints. So Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 15 all the way down through 23. Follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. He exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at, the right, at his right hand in the heavens far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as a head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So how should we be praying for the saints. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, the first way that Paul teaches us to pray for the saints is that we should pray that they would know God more. Pray that they would know God more. There's no greater goal in this life than to know God and to be known by God. To know God and to be known by God. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. And then Paul in Philippians writes this. says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, we've said over and over again that this letter is written to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus. That tells us that they're already known by God. 
And so Paul's prayer is not that they would be known by God because he knows that they already are. His prayer is that they would know God more. Paul's asking that they receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so this, is, this isn't Paul just saying, God, I pray that you would give them wisdom so that they can make good business decisions. I pray that you would give them wisdom so that they would know how to parent their children and, and give them a copy of the Bible to look at every now and then. That, that's not the type of wisdom and revelation that, that Paul is, is talking about. This prayer is a prayer that they would be given wisdom and revelation to know God more. John chapter 14, Jesus says this, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have told you. So Jesus says that the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to remind you of everything. He's going to teach you all things. And now Paul is praying that that same spirit that Jesus said would teach and remind the disciples. He's saying that, that I pray that, that when he would teach you, that he would give you wisdom, that he would reveal God to you. Now, when we think of the word revelation, in church, most of the time, we, we jump directly to the book of Revelation, right? It's called the, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. But that's not what Paul has in mind when he's talking about Revelation here, that, that, that we would have this spirit of wisdom and revelation to, to reveal something. And in fact, every time it's used in the New Testament, a total of 18 times, it means to make something known. How many of you have seen The Wizard of Oz? Right, so, so what happens, Dorothy and, and, and the other characters, they, they get into the Emerald City and they go into where the wizard is and, and what does Toto do? Right, the little dog runs over and he grabs the curtain and he pulls back the curtain and what does that do? That, that reveals the wizard, right? It literally means to, to peel back or to open, to make known. So Paul, when, when he's talking about this here, he's saying, listen, I'm praying for you that God would reveal to you himself, that he would make known to you himself so that you could, when you read scripture, that you could see him and know him. When you pray that he would open your eyes to see him and to know him, that he would reveal himself to you. Do you think we still need to pray for that in our lives today? That's what Paul was praying for them. <coughs> D.A. Carson says this, what is the greatest need in the church today? The one thing we need is a deeper knowledge of God. We need to know God better. That's what Paul was praying for the church at Ephesus. And that's what you and I need to pray for one another. Pray that we would know God better. How well do you know God? How much do you know about God? Uh, let, me, let me ask it this way. How much more do you think there is to know about God than what you already know? He's infinite. There, there's no way that you can know everything there is to know about God, but don't let that stop you from knowing everything that you possibly can about God. You can study and pray and read for your entire life, and you're not fully going to know who God is, but you're going to know God more. If you do that, seek to know him more and pray that your brothers and sisters in Christ will know him more. That's the first way that Paul tells us. The second way that Paul teaches us to pray for the saints is to pray that they would know his hope. He tells us that in verse 18. He says, I pray that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So this is Specific is hope, but it's specifically about the hope of his calling. So, so before we can understand the hope, we need to make sure that we understand what Paul means by the calling or by God's calling. And this term is used multiple times in the New Testament. And every time it's used, it's talking about salvation. So when we talk about being called by God, it's about salvation. Here's some references. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 will we'll be there in a couple months. Paul encourages us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, in a manner worthy of our salvation. In 2 Timothy, Paul says that God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Peter tells us to be more diligent to make certain about God's calling of us, about his salvation. So it's a reference to his salvation. 
And keep in mind that it's his calling. It's not our calling. We didn't call ourselves God called. God is the one that saves. We'll, we'll get there next week. But it's by grace that you're saved. Not because of anything that you did. Not because you were awesome or that you may one day be awesome. It's because God is already awesome. And so it's by his grace that you're saved. Not through works. So what is the hope of his calling? Paul really doesn't give us that in these verses, but if we back up to the last week when we talked about being sealed, being kept by the Holy Spirit, right? We, we said that, that when you're saved, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit and nothing can undo that seal and that the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of salvation. Amen. That's our hope. That's the hope and the calling. He wants you to know that, that he who started a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God saves you, he's keeping you saved, and he will complete your salvation. That's the hope in our calling. Our hope is not in that we are going to keep ourselves saved or that we save ourselves. Our hope is that it's outside of us. Because I promise you, I would mess it up. Right? You would mess it up. God's not going to mess it up. That is the hope of our calling. God saved us and he's going to keep us saved. And if it was any other way, there would not be any Hope, but there is hope, and you need to know that hope. And so do those around you. So do the saints need that. So pray that they would know his hope. Thirdly, Paul teaches us when we pray for the saints, pray they would know his treasure. Back again in verse 18, Paul says that you may know what is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, last week, if you remember, we spoke about our inheritance. We said that, that the Holy Spirit is the down payment on our inheritance. And our inheritance is heaven. It's eternal life. It's glorification. It's shedding this mortal body and putting on immortality. It's, it's leaving behind the, the pains and the trials and the tribulation of this world and stepping into a, a new world, a heavenly realm where there are no pains, where there are no trials, where there are no tribulations. There's just glory. That's what our inheritance is. But Paul is not talking about our inheritance here. In fact, he doesn't say our inheritance. What does he say? His glorious inheritance. Not Paul's, God's. This is God's glorious inheritance. So what does that mean? God's glorious inheritance in the saints. How could God have an inheritance? An inheritance... Is something that you get that you don't already have, right? So how could God get an inheritance? Is there anything that God does not have? This is like asking the question, well, what do you buy the rich person who can buy anything in the world? Right? Elon Musk, richest man in the world. If you were going to buy him a birthday present, what would you get him? There's nothing on this planet that he can't buy. Well, what is it that God is going to inherit that he doesn't already have? Think about it this way. What did Jesus Christ gain on this side of the cross that he didn't have on the other side of the cross? You. Me. We are his inheritance. God didn't buy, or God, God didn't have us to begin with, right? Because we were separated from him. God didn't force salvation on anyone because then it wouldn't be an inheritance. Our salvation, yes, bought and paid for by Christ Jesus, by that free gift. But that is God's inheritance. He inherits that. We're his, think about that. You are his treasure. I am his treasure. You grasp that, and that'll, that'll change the way that you see God. You are his glorious inheritance. It'll make you remember the song that I read earlier where David said, God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I, I thirst for you. The, the image there is like he's crawling across the desert. There, there's no water. I'm about to die. And all I want is one more drink. That's the eagerness and the longing that he has for God. That, that's, he says, you are better than life. When you realize that you are God's treasure, that's how you'll feel. That's how we'll operate. We sang the song, we opened the service with the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And that's 
Listen, that's one of those songs I could sing every single week because I love that song so much. But, but here is the first verse. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make what? A wretch, that's you and me, but that's you, to make a wretch his what? Treasure. That's what that song is saying, that, that you are, that God gave his son to make you his treasure. Did you know that you are God's treasure? <coughs> Paul wants you to know that. And listen, you need to pray that others will know that as well. That the others in Christ Jesus will know that you, that they are his treasure. Fourth way, the final way that Paul teaches us to pray for the saints it's to pray that they would know his power. That they would know his power. And, and this is really the climax of the prayer. And we know that because Paul spends the majority of the time in this passage talking about God's power. He calls it the immeasurable greatness of his power. And that's uh, something that's easy to skip by. But you've got to think about that. The immeasurable greatness of his power. Well, the, the, the theological term is omnipotence. Omni, all, power. All powerful. There's, there's no power greater than God. There, there's nothing that God cannot do. God is all powerful. Remember, chapters 1 through 3 are, are about doctrine. And so what Paul is teaching here, he's, remember who he's teaching, right? We said, yes, they are the, the saints in Christ Jesus, but they're Ephesians. They're not Jews, they're Gentiles. These people didn't grow up hearing over and over and over again about the God of the Old Testament. They didn't grow up hearing about the God who spoke and worlds came into existence. They didn't grow up learning these things. And so Paul is saying, listen, you need to know about the power of this God. Remember, they had temples, 50 different gods they had temples to in Ephesus including the, the temple to Diana, which is considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And Paul is saying, listen, it ain't them. They don't have the power that this God has. This God has real power. And so he's teaching them that in this passage that, that they have power. It's, God did a lot of stuff in the Old Testament, right? We, we, we've seen the things that he's done in the Old Testament. He parted the Red Sea and and, and then led the, the Israelites out and all these other miraculous saints, but there's nothing he did in the Old Testament that compares to what he did in the New Testament. But what did he do in the New Testament? Paul jumps right to it when he talks about the resurrection. Now that is the greatest display of God's power that has ever happened. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has the power to raise the dead. And listen, Jesus is not the first person to come back from the dead. And you, you go to the Old Testament and you'll read multiple times, um, Elijah raised a little boy from the dead. Okay. Jesus raised a little girl from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after he had been dead for four days. Paul, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, Paul's preaching. And he's been preaching for like three hours and it's almost midnight. And a, and a teenager, about the age of these guys right over here, Right around that, that high school age, is sitting in the windowsill. He falls asleep while Paul is preaching. And he falls three stories out of the window and smacks on the ground and he's dead. And I might say, serves you right, should have been awake. But, but Paul went down and, and Paul laid down over him and Paul raised him from the dead. And, and then listen, over here. The kid got back up and he went back upstairs and Paul continued to preach. I'm just going to throw that in extra. And he was excited now that Paul was preaching, right? Jesus is not the first one to be raised from the dead, but here's the difference. Who raised that little boy in the Old Testament from the dead? Elijah. Who raised Lazarus from the dead? Jesus. Who raised the little boy, that, the, the teenager that fell out of the window from the dead? Paul. Who went to the tomb to raise Jesus from the dead? Nobody. Nobody did. It's, it, nobody went and said, you're not dead anymore. Right? This is Jesus. It's like, all right, listen. It's been three days. That's long enough. I'm not dead anymore. That, that's a different kind of power than any God 
that the Ephesians knew, that any God that the Ephesians had ever worshipped before. God has a unique power that's above all other powers because he is all-powerful. And it says that, that he was given the name that is above every other name, right? That, that, that he was given the title above every other. That, that, that means that, that the title that he had was greater than the title that Caesar had. That to say Jesus is Lord was in direct opposition and defiance of the Roman government because they would make you say Caesar is Lord. And yet Paul is saying that, that Jesus has this title, that Jesus is Lord. But listen, he didn't just have that title way back then. He, he has it right now, but he doesn't just have that title right now. He's going to have it in the future. When you read Revelation chapter 19, in Revelation chapter 19, it tells us about this rider on a white horse that's coming back, that the sword of the Spirit comes out of his mouth to slay the nation. That's Jesus Christ. And it says that on his thigh is written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the title of Jesus. That's the, the power of Jesus. We talk about Armageddon, and, and I love, you know, Hollywood wants to make it this big, big deal. But, but when you read the Bible, it's going to be all, all of one army, all of Satan's army is going to be lined up over here, and, and all of Christ's army is going to be lined up over here, and God's going to speak, and the war's over. Right? It's, it's kind of anticlimactic because God's just too powerful. It's not going to happen that way. He's praying. Paul is praying that they would know that power. That they would know in the midst of a society that has many gods, that they would know the one true God and his power. And that's the way that we should pray for our church, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you know the power of Jesus? His power over sin and death, his power over the grave, his power to defeat the enemy once and for all. His power to save. Do, do you know the power of Jesus? I pray that you do. And listen, as a faith family, we need to pray that one another knows that power. Pray that they know God, that they know his hope, that they know his treasure, and that they know his power. And the reason that we need to pray that for our Church for the saints, for our faith family. That that is our big idea for the day, which is this. When the church knows Christ more, the church will make Christ more known. When the church knows Christ more, when you know Christ more, you will make Christ more known. Our mission as a church is to move people into a more dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ, and you can't do that if you don't know him. But as you know him, you'll make him known. As you know him, you will help to move people into a more dynamic relationship with Christ. And that, that's our goal. And, and I want to give you three action steps as we wrap up this morning that will help us to achieve or to work towards that goal. The first is this. Pray for your faith family. I've asked, I've printed out a little sheet. It's not going to have everybody's name in here. If your name's not on there, don't be mad at me. Don't be offended. There's some blanks where, where people can write your name in. But, but if y'all, Ed, if you'll go ahead and y'all hand those out right now. Uh, this, I, I've printed out a list of, of most everybody that's in this room, you're on that list. If you look around and you see somebody that's in the room and not on the list, find out their name and write it in one of the blanks at the bottom. This is the list of your faith family. Those who attend, those who have joined with us. These are the people that you need to pray for. These are the people that, that as you looked around earlier, you saw them. You saw these names. Pray for them. Paul, in verses 15 and 16, we, we didn't spend much time there, but Paul says, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. The idea there is that he is constantly praying for them. I never stop. When, when have you prayed enough for your faith family? Either when they're in heaven or you are. Because Paul says, I never stop. Don't stop praying. And don't stop praying for your faith family and pray for them in this way. 
Don't just pray that they'll get over the cold that they have. Pray that they'll know God. And that they'll make him known. Pray that they know his calling and his treasure and his power. So action step number one, pray for your faith family and don't stop praying. Number two, study Ephesians to know God more. You can just jump anywhere in the Bible, but because we're in Ephesians and we're going to be there for a while, and because it is so rich in teaching about God, don't be afraid of the word theology. Do you know what the word theology means? The first half of it, T-H-E, is from the Greek word that means God. Theos, it means God. And the last part means to know or to study. So theology just means to know God or to study about God. Next week, we're going to be in chapter 2, 1 through 10, probably the single greatest section in the Bible about salvation. i got to stop thinking about it because I'm just going to go right into it this morning. Um, pack a lunch next week. I don't know. Uh, that, go ahead and read that ahead of time. Look for repeated words. I've told you week after week in these passages, look for repeated words. There's some next week that just jump off the page and it, it blows my mind the way that it's organized by Paul. So look for repeated words. Uh, look for words like you and we and us. Look for descriptions of what God did. So it's going to say things that, that God did this for us or God did this. Look for, for those things. Study that passage. Study Ephesians to know God more. Because listen, remember, when you know God more, you'll make him more known. Lastly, make Christ known to someone this week, right? That's the purpose of knowing God more. It's not just so that you can gorge yourself on theology. You take that and you put it into practice. When you, when you know that God created all things and that sin has separated man from God and that, that anyone who is separated from God is not only deserving of but rightly headed to an eternity separated from God in hell. And you know that God created a way to where that did not have to happen then you should put that into practice and you should make Christ known. So make Christ known to someone this week. Make the gospel known to them. That, that Jesus died so that they can live. That Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection bought and paid the penalty for their sins. That if they would just confess their sins, believe in what Jesus Christ has already done in their place, that they will be saved. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing the song when we see your face. And it, 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 the song is talking about a, a future time when we see his face. But, but as we sing this, as we're getting ready for communion, I want you to think back also to Jesus' face when he's on the cross. That's what communion is, a remembrance of the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. And, and while I pray and, and while we sing, that will be your chance to confess any sin. Paul is very specific in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which we'll read part of that as we observe the Lord's Supper in a few moments. But if you continue to read past that, Paul says, listen, if you come to the Lord's table with a wrong heart, with unconfessed sin, it's not a good thing. He said that some have gotten sick and some have died because of the way they have approached the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. So I encourage you to, to pray as I'm praying, to pray as we sing, to ask God to reveal sin in your life, to confess that sin, or don't take communion because it is that serious. Maybe you need to say, I need to get right with God for the first time ever. And if that's what you need to do today, then do that. Do that right here, right now. Now, if you need to reach out to me later today or sometime this week to do that, there's multiple ways of connecting with me. Reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and then we'll worship again in song. God, you are our God. You are the great and mighty God, the one true God. And we're here to worship you. As we read what Paul wrote to that church.
nearly 2,000 years ago, God, we know that it still applies to us today, that we need to know you more. And so that's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for our faith family. And God, I pray that we won't just hear this sermon and, and walk out the door and forget it. But then we'll take that list of names. Then we'll add to that list of names. And that every single day we will pray and we won't stop praying. As we pray for our faith family to, to know you more, God, I look forward to what you're going to do in and through us as we put our knowledge of you into action. As we move into a time of worship through song and worship through observance of the Lord's Supper in just a few moments, God, I pray that we would examine our hearts, that you would help us to examine our hearts as David wrote, search us, God, search our hearts and let us know if there's any wrong way within us, any sin that we haven't confessed. God, bring that to the surface so that we can confess that before we observe communion. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand together and sing this song. When we see your face.
seated. If you do not have a cup for communion and you need one, if you'll just raise your hand and our gentleman will bring one uh, to you. Again, this is, uh, we treat this very seriously. Uh, I think that, that Paul treats it very seriously and so we're going to follow in that uh, communion is available for all those who are faithful saints in Christ Jesus. And so that simply means that you have uh, come to the point in your life where at some point in time you confessed your sin. You said, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve death and hell, but I trust in what Christ has done on my behalf. I confess my sins to you. I believe in Jesus Christ. God save me. If you have done that in some way, shape, or form in your life, you are welcome to observe communion with us. And again, uh, sins confessed. And so let's make sure that, that we have that right with the Lord as well. We're going to start with uh, the bread, which is on uh, the bottom. And so if you'll take and, and open that, I'll read the scripture and pray. And then we will uh, take that together and then we'll move on to the juice. First Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. God, there are a lot of things that I don't understand. And this is at the top of the list. Why Jesus would die in my place. That the words thankful don't even begin to express the emotions that, that I feel that we feel, God. I look forward to the day that when we do see your face, when we can fully, in a glorified body, fully express our gratitude to you. But until then, God, we simply say thank you as we worship you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that our relationship with you can be made right and so that we could spend eternity in heaven with you. God, we thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. Paul continues, he says, in the same way he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I'm going to pray and then we will be dismissed. God, we worship you. Our creator, our redeemer, the one who has saved us, who's keeping us saved and will complete our salvation. God, my prayer is that we would, as Paul said, know you and the hope of your calling. And that we would understand that, that we are your treasure. And above all, God, that we would know your power, your power to save. And so as we leave this place today, as we strive, God, to move people into a more dynamic relationship with Christ. God, let us now knowing you more, make you more known and share the good news of Jesus with a lost and dying world that is desperate to hear it. 
we thank you for loving us, for saving us, and God, yes, for sending us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.